Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for November 16th through 22nd, 2020. This is covering Ether chapters 6 through 11. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, look at those scriptures. (laughs) <laughs> and now let's consult the Scripture Matic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 43 minutes, 10 seconds. And curiosity, how long would it take for us to read it daily? 6 minutes, 10 seconds. Fantastic. So here we've got time codes. If you want to jump to chapters individually. Otherwise, buckle up and let's jump into hundreds of of years of Jaredite history. Sounds fun. Now, when we last left you, Jared, his brother, their friends, and then all of their families were led from the Tower of Babel across the wilderness to the seashore. There, they are commanded to build barges. Now, this is something they've done before, but there's something different about this design. It had some things they weren't sure how to work out. The Lord provided the needed solutions of how we're going to get air, how do we navigate, and what about light? And now they are ready for their journey. Before we jump into their journey, there was a quote that I came across in the Gospel Doctrine Manual that really kind of fits more with our previous lesson, but I didn't find it while we were recording our previous lesson, so I'm going to include it here. This is from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's book, Christ in the New Covenant. We've quoted a lot from that in this show. It says, quote, The brother of Jared may not have had great belief in himself, but his belief in God was unprecedented. In that there is hope for us all. His faith was without doubt or limit. Once and for all, it was declared that ordinary people with ordinary challenges could rend the veil of unbelief and enter the realms of eternity, end quote. So well said. Yeah, that's really the important message, the important takeaway from the story of the brother of Jared. It really is amazing. Yeah, it sure is. So let's go into chapter 6. All right. What about chapter 6, Jay? Well, we take the first four verses, say we've got the brother of Jared. He's got the stones. Remember, the Lord has touched these stones with his finger. He's putting one in each end of the vessel, these barges, so they can have light. And they prepared food of all kinds for themselves and their animals. They get aboard the vessels, and then they set forth into the sea. This is verse 4. Interesting phrase here commending themselves unto the Lord their God. Think about what it means to commend yourself unto the Lord your God. They're in these barges. The barges have no steering. That means the trip is entirely dependent on the Lord and his will. Kind of a little bit like life. And then you put your trust in the Lord and say, we will do everything we can do We trust that you will bring us to the promised land. And if you want to look at this travel, this journey, very much like a parallel to our life, you're going to find some other interesting connections as well. Let's go on. Yeah, in verse 5, And it came to pass that the Lord God caused that there should be a furious wind blow upon the face of the waters towards the promised land. And thus they were tossed upon the waves of the sea before the wind. And it came to pass that they were many times buried in the depths of the sea because of the mountain waves which broke upon them, and also the great and terrible tempests which were caused by the fierceness of the wind. Now, why do we have to have this? I'm the kind of person that might say, okay, well, how about the gentle breeze version of life? You know, just gently (laughs) push the barges along. But that isn't it. That's not what the Lord is doing. And let's be clear that the Lord has prepared them for this. If we go back to chapter 2, let's look back here in Ether 2, 24 and 25, but let's read 25 first. In 25, he says, And behold, I prepare you against these things. 
for ye cannot cross this great deep, save I prepare you against the waves of the sea and the winds which have gone forth and the floods which shall come. So there's going to be all these things, but the Lord will prepare us for those challenges. But where is all of this coming from? Where are all the hardships and the winds and the floods coming from? Let's jump ahead to the previous verse in verse 24. It says, For behold, ye shall be as a whale in the midst of the sea, for the mountain wave shall dash upon you. Nevertheless, I will bring you up again out of the depths of the sea, for the winds have gone forth out of my mouth. And also the rains and the floods have I sent forth. And if we look back on the verses we just read back in chapter six, in verse five, it says the Lord caused that there should be a furious wind blow. There's maybe a comfort in this. These winds, these waves, the floods, they're all coming from the Lord, but with a purpose. They're all to get them to the promised land. And to do that, there's a comfort in knowing that it's the Lord that sent them because he knows how to prepare us against them. How should we be prepared? Well, and there is certainly faith building as part of the, you are going to be buried in the depths of the sea and you will have to trust that I will bring you up again. You will have to trust that although these mountain waves that are crashing upon you, that you will be safe, that you will be taken care of. And one more thought, the gentle breeze version, I'm sure that's the four or five year journey to the promised <laughs> land as opposed to less than a year. And so <laughs> that is probably what was taken into consideration as well. Well, and that's true because it's not just the destination. The Lord has things planned for us, for our benefit, to bless us on that journey. And they're not necessarily pink bunnies and fluffy dandelions. There's going to be hardship, but it's meant to create a person who's ready for that promised land. We've all had them of various kinds, these winds and floods and so forth that push us and stretch us and test us. But the Lord knows how to prepare us against those things. The Lord is using those things as tools, or maybe in this case, certainly, to help us to get to the promised land. So let's learn. There's more we can learn from these people about how to handle the rough journey. So let's keep going. Verse 7, And it came to pass that when they were buried in the deep, there was no water that could hurt them, their vessels being tight like unto a dish. And also they were tight like unto the ark of Noah. Therefore, when they were encompassed about by many waters, they did cry unto the Lord, and he did bring them forth again upon the top of the waters. And it came to pass that the wind did never cease to blow towards the promised land while they were upon the waters, and thus they were driven forth before the wind. Now, quick aside note there, what's interesting is that they compared their vessel to the ark of Noah they are only a, probably a couple of centuries detached from Noah. Yeah, not too far. So that was far. a near reference that they knew. Yeah. That notion, too, that the wind did never cease to blow. So by one way of looking at it, you could say, oh, why won't the wind stop? Well, maybe they really did know, and they seem to, that this wind, for all the challenges it brings with it, is moving them toward an amazing place, a promised land. Something else to remember, John brought this up as far as them being buried in the water and it couldn't hurt them. Well, that's great. I'm glad that the ship was tight like unto a dish. But what level of trust do you need to have that you will come back up on the top of the waters, as it says at the end of verse 7, so that you can open up and get air? You know, I'm glad they were protected from the water, but you could see why they would have cried unto the Lord so that they could come up and have air. The Lord knows what they need. This whole journey is about these challenges, and yet look how they face them. They cried unto the Lord. They put themselves in the Lord's hand, commending themselves to him. And they cried unto the Lord for what they needed. And then, as we'll see, they were very grateful. But before we get to that in verse 9, I was thinking of a poem that I'd heard long ago, author unknown, but it's a great comparison to this idea of the ship being tight and about us making our ships like that ourselves. It goes like this. All the water in the world, 
however hard it tried, could never sink the smallest chip unless it gets inside. And all the evil in the world, the blackest kind of sin, can never hurt a human soul unless you let it in. So let's keep our ships tight like unto a dish. Indeed. Let's go on to verse 9. And they did sing praises unto the Lord. Yea, the brother of Jared did sing praises unto the Lord. And he did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. And when the night came, they did not cease to praise the Lord. I love, by the way, Mm. that the brother of Jared was a singer. Yeah. You know, it's fun to realize that there are actually a few of our even modern prophets that were musicians. Howard W. Hunter played in a band. Ezra Taft Benson was known to have a really nice tenor voice. Oh, nice. Good stuff. And thus they were driven forth, and no monster of the sea could break them, neither whale that could mar them. And they did have light continually, whether it was above the water or under the water. And thus they were driven forth. 344 days upon the water. And they did land upon the shore of the promised land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. Now, here's some things to think about. 344 days, so this is almost a year that they were on the water. That is a long journey. That is a long time to trust in the Lord that you're actually going to get to where you're supposed to go. But look at one of the trademarks of the journey is that they were singing praises. This isn't after they arrived. They were singing praises while they were on the trip. In their hardships. Yeah, exactly. And then they reach the promised land, and then they shed tears of joy. Yeah. They've made it to their destination. The Lord has fulfilled his promise, and they are grateful. But what is the power of gratitude while we are in the depths of the sea? What is the power of gratitude while we're facing the challenges that the journey takes? I think something that I take away from this is one Don't forget that the Lord is blowing us toward the promised land. Two, remember the journey is purposeful. What we're given on the journey, how we've been prepared for the journey is purposeful. It has meaning. It's not just suffering for the sake of suffering. There's purpose in it. And the fact that when they were in need, they called upon the Lord and the Lord lifted them up. And I look at this example of them singing praises. Am I the kind of person that sings praises in my heart, even when things are hard? And then how much when we succeed, whether we've reached the promised land or successes along the way, verse 12, is that how I behave? It's a great model for those that are successful in the journey. So in chapter 6, as we continue on, verse 13 through, oh, let's go maybe through 29, the Jaredites arrived in the promised land and they began to establish their families and raise crops. And they taught their children to walk humbly before the Lord. And they multiplied and grew strong in the land. And as Jared and his brother neared the end of their lives, they gathered their people together and asked what they would like to have done for them. And the people answered that they wanted a king. Now, this was troubling, especially to the brother of Jared, who in verse 23 says, Surely this thing leadeth into captivity. They have records of what went on before. They have experiences. They recognize how dangerous this is. But Jared encourages his brother and says, Let's let the people have what they want. However, the people choose the brother of Jared's son, Pagag, and Pagag refuses. And then the people, (laughs) I love this. This is not a good start. The people in verse 25 demand that the brother of Jared force his son to be king. And the brother of Jared says that they should definitely not constrain anyone to be their king. So the people choose all the brothers of Pagag. They all refuse. And all of Jared's sons refuse except the last one, 
Oriha is his name, and he accepts the role in verse 27 to be king. Now, I wanted to mention something about that Oriha was chosen to be king. When it lists the sons of Jared in verse 14, Oriha is the last one listed, which in the way they usually do these things throughout the Book of Mormon, that means he's the youngest one. If it is in fact the youngest one that is chosen to be king, this may have implications later on. As we followed the Book of Mormon story, very often it's an oldest son who becomes the next king or chief judge or high priest of the church or whatever. But here, there's some evidence that people lived quite a bit longer at this point. Remember, this is maybe, you know, 1,500, 2,000 years before Lehi's people. It doesn't seem to be that abnormal that they live longer. As a matter of fact, later in the lesson, we're going to see somebody who lived to be 142 in chapter 9. If that's the case, then they would be the king until toward the end of their life. So it would continue to be the youngest who becomes king. And if that's the case, it explains a lot of the rebellions we're going to see because it's the older sons that are going to rebel because there's no chance they're going to get the kingdom unless they take it. So we can pay attention to that as we go. Yeah, to your point, there's a good case for that. This is about two centuries before Abraham, and Abraham himself lived to be 175. Yeah. So this was probably at a time when people lived longer. Yeah, so it seems. So despite that, right now, things are going great. The people are prospering, and they have become exceedingly rich. And then Jared and his brother pass away in verse 29. And verse 30 says this, And it came to pass that Oriha did walk humbly before the Lord and did remember how great things the Lord had done for his father. Remember how important that is. I said remember. (laughs) Remembering, very important. He remembered how great things the Lord had done for his father and also taught his people how great things the Lord had done for their fathers. So things are starting out great with Oriha. Yeah, we're off to a good start. We are. And that brings us to chapter 7. Now, in these first six verses, I should just give you the heads up. We're covering through chapter 11, as John said. And the Jaredite history is about twice what the Book of Mormon history is with the Nephites and Lamanites. So we're going to be covering a lot of history in a very short amount of time. Although we do want to pause as we're going through this and help you to get to know some of the people that Moroni gives us a little more information about. All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look here at what happens after Oriha. Oriha reigns in righteousness all his days, and he has a son, Kib, in his old age. And Kib, so again, we have this idea of the son of his old age is the one who will reign. So Kib's reign seems to go well. And then he has a son, Korahor, who at age 32 rebels. Why does he rebel? Well, probably because there's no chance he's going to be king. So instead, he goes to the land of Nehor and has fair sons and daughters, draws away people to join him. And when Korahor has a sufficient army, He marches to Morin. Morin is the land of first inheritance for the Jaredites. It's kind of their capital city. So he marches there where the king is and captures his father. He puts him in bondage. Now, in bondage to the Jaredites appears to not necessarily be being put in a prison because people, when they're in bondage, seem to be able to still have a life, which we'll see with Kib. But it seems to be that Putting them in bondage is to take away their authority. That's what I would propose as we go forward. So now we've got the beginning of the fulfillment of the brother of Jared's prophecy, and it happened pretty quick. If we look at Oriha as our first king, then we've got Kib, and now we've got Korahor and things are falling apart. Yeah, Korahor is Jared's great-grandson. Yeah. That's how long it took for the brother of Jared's prophecy to be fulfilled. Yes, yes. So let's keep going. Kib now maybe doesn't have power, but he still has a family. And in his old age, he begat Shul. So now, just to be clear, Shul and Korahor, who's taken the kingdom, they are brothers. They're quite an age difference, but still brothers. Shul is angry with his brother. And I should tell you that Shul is one of my heroes in the Book of Mormon. Look what he does here. 
he goes to the hill Ephraim and he makes metal swords, arms his followers. These are people he has drawn away to follow him. And then he goes and attacks his brother, Korahor, and takes the kingdom back and gives it to his father. Now, his father is quite old and so gives the kingdom to Shul, his son. So as interesting as that might be, just as a story, it's kind of a neat little story. But look at it for a minute through the lens of, say, the plan of salvation. Let's start partway through verse 8. It says, Shul waxed strong and became mighty. What does it mean to wax strong? Well, you think of the moon waxes and wanes. It means to grow, to become. Shul wasn't always awesome. It was a journey that he had for him to become strong and mighty, not only in physical strength, but mighty in judgment. That takes effort, time, experience, failures, learning from them. So Shul's had a whole life to become the kind of person he will become to be used by the Lord at this moment. And then in verse 9, he came to the hill Ephraim. Now that's interesting to me because there's very few geographic markers that we are given for the Jaredites, in part because Moroni is writing a very abbreviated account. Not even a hundredth part are we getting of the abbreviated version they had. So we're not giving a lot of landmarks, and yet Moroni gives us this one. And if we look in the Bible dictionary under Ephraim, it helps us to remember that that tribe is given the privilege of the gathering in the last days to have an important part in that. Now, there's no tribes of Israel at the point that they left the old world, the Jaredites. So this isn't something he would have had in the scriptures or that he would have known about. So we don't know why the hill was named Ephraim, but the fact that Moroni knows about it and includes that detail I just find interesting, and let me share where it might fit into this as an allegorical story. If the hill Ephraim represents that place where people are gathered, elevated, then we've got somebody like Shul that makes swords. And what does the sword mean in the armor of God? The sword is the spirit, which is the word of God. So he's arming those that he has drawn away after him, which again makes him somebody like Nephi, not somebody who is just content to be righteous on their own, but who insists on helping others be elevated and become righteous to fight against greed and corruption, which is represented by his brother Korahor. So here it is, he elevates these people, he draws them away after his righteous cause, he arms them with the word of God, with the spirit, and then they go out to fight corruption and wickedness and pride, and they do, they succeed, and so what happens? He's given the kingdom. By who? By his father. So think about that with us, you know, the fighting the good fight and being given the kingdom by our father in heaven. It's just a little story, and maybe you'd think I'm reading a little too much into it. Fair enough. But that's what I see with it. It's kind of a neat little plan of salvation packed right into these few verses. I'm not sure it was that Moroni missed it. It feels like it was sculpted a bit by him around this story. But either way, it's good to look carefully, not just at the story, but why is Moroni telling us this story? What does he want us to learn from it? So that's one way you could look at it. And we're going to learn a little bit more about Shul's character in this chapter. Oh, my goodness. Supports very much what Jay is saying. He's so good. I love him so much. Okay, let's take a look. Not only him, he's got a great family. So let's take a look at this. He's got the kingdom now. Shul is the king. And let's start with verse 14. Oh, I should mention, Korhor is not killed. He doesn't kill his brother. He preserves him, and Korhor swears to be loyal to Shul, and as a result, Shul gives him power in his kingdom. And Korhor never rebels against his brother. So that's great. But Korhor has a son in verse 15. His name is Noah, and he is out of kingdom. He could have maybe, I don't know, if he would have rebelled against his father and stolen the kingdom, you know, just kind of a father-son bonding moment. But here, there's no way he's going to be the king now. So he rebels against Shul and his father. Remember, his father is loyal 
So he rebels against Shul, who's his uncle, and fights against him. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, it says that when he gave battle unto Shul, the king, he obtained the land of their first inheritance. Now, we know already that's the land of Morin. So he took the capital and he became a king over that part of the land. Now, he hasn't taken all the kingdom, but he's taken a chunk of the kingdom and he's captured the capital. The reason that's important is for what's coming up. It says in 17 that he gave battle again to Shul and took him captive. So now he's captured him and brought him back to Morin, which used to be Shul's home. Now Noah is the king over it. His nephew is. So it came to pass that he was about to put him to death. Whoa, wait a minute. That's not how this works. See, look at the pattern we've had so far. If you decide to rebel against the king, like Korhor did, you leave the other king alive. You don't kill him. But Noah must have looked at that and said, you know what? That's a bad plan because Korhor left Kib alive, his dad. And as a result, Shul rose up and took the kingdom away from Korhor. Now, Shul left Korhor alive. And as a result, his son rose up and well, is in the process of taking the kingdom away. So I suspect he's saying, you know what? That's a dumb tradition. Tell you what let's do. I'm just going to kill you. But let me explain why that was a bad idea. See, he may have thought, I want to get rid of you before one of your sons rises up and takes the kingdom from me. But he made two mistakes that I would propose. One, Shul already has super awesome, loyal sons. That's going to be a problem for Noah. And thing number two, Noah is living in the capital and has made himself king. Where do you think he's living I don't think he's in a hotel. There must be a palace or some official building where the king lives. If I don't miss my guess, he established himself in the castle. I'll call it a castle or palace. But that's the very palace where those boys, Jules' sons, grew up. Now, I don't know what your experience has been with boys, but for you boys out there, if you grew up in a place, don't you know like every inch of that place? Haven't you explored, laid siege to, escaped from every part of your house or farm or wherever you are? There's not a less safe place in the kingdom than for Noah to be sleeping in the very house where those boys grew up and they're on the loose. So take a look. They've got the home court advantage. Oh my gosh, yes. They would know where the servants are and where the shadows are and how to get up on the roof and everything. So when it says it came to pass that he was about to put him to death, meaning, and it'll explain the next day is when he's going to put Shul to death. The sons of Shul crept into the house of Noah by night and slew him and broke down the door of the prison and brought out their father and placed him upon his throne in his own kingdom. Remember, the kingdoms are still split right now. So they get his father out of there. But as I imagine this, and I get the privilege as an artist to imagine this because it happened somehow and I wanted to do a painting of it. So I imagined it this way and I'll share you my backstory with the hopes that it might help your imagination. When I was a little kid, well, maybe you've had this experience where you wake up in the middle of the night and you're not sure why you woke up, but you're looking around your room and there's like some kind of a silhouetted shape and you begin asking yourself, was that there before? Is that a person? Did that just move? You know, and of course, it's nothing, but you have those questions. Sometimes you wake up because you can sense somebody's in the room. And I don't know exactly how we do that. But when I was a little kid, if I would wake up with a bad dream, I wasn't very good at knowing how to wake my parents up. And so what I would do is I would come into the room and I'd be kind of too scared because I'm already scared. I don't want to wake my dad up, say. So I would just slowly walk over and stand right by his head. It's kind of like you become a vacuum for sound so that you're so quiet that you become the quietest thing in the room. And what happened inevitably is my dad's breathing would change and all of a sudden he'd wake up, you know, very surprised. And blah, And then I would get all, you know, even more scared. I think many of you can relate to what I'm talking about. OK, so take that in mind. And now apply it to this story. Imagine Noah is sleeping the night before he's going to eliminate his competitor, this rival king. 
And he wakes up in the middle of the night and he's looking around his room. And he sees a shadow by the window and he thinks, is that a person? And just as he begins to comfort himself that, no, that's probably just something. Then all of a sudden, I want these shadows to move and come out of the darkness and bring down their weapons. And that's the last time Noah sees or hears anything. So that to me is how I imagine the death of Noah with these sons who know their way around the palace. So they rescue their father. They place him on his throne. But now look what happens. His son, Noah's son, and again, this gives more credence to the fact that there's a longer lifespan going on here because not only does his son, Kohor, take over the kingdom and try to war against Shul, it doesn't go well for him. He gets killed. But then his son, in verse 22, named Nimrod, who apparently was named after the great hunter, Nimrod gives the kingdom back to Shul in verse 22, and look at the results of it. We see the results of rebellion and greed. It led to death and destruction. Nimrod says, you know what? I'm going to choose a different path. So he goes for honesty and virtue. And it says, he did gain favor in the eyes of Shul, wherefore Shul did bestow great favors upon him. And he did do in the kingdom of Shul according to his desires. Do you want peace and freedom agency? Well, then be righteous. His fathers tried to get it by force, by blood, but... Nimrod got it and kept it and didn't have to fear because he had done what was right and good and honest and noble. And as a result, he got to do according to his desires in the kingdom. Not a bad choice, Nimrod. Well done. He was free. He was. Now, Nimrod got it, but let's see how Shul did. We have a different insight into Shul's character here in verse 23. And also in the reign of Shul, there came prophets among the people who were sent from the Lord, prophesying that the wickedness and idolatry of the people was bringing a curse upon the land, and they should be destroyed if they did not repent. And it came to pass that the people did revile against the prophets and did mock them. And it came to pass that King Shul did execute judgment against all those who did revile against the prophets. And he did execute a law throughout the land, which gave power unto the prophets that they should go whithersoever they would. And by this cause, the people were brought unto repentance. Now, that's interesting. Well, that had all the setup of a really bad story, but Shul came through. Yeah, he could have been a dictator and just said, you all must believe this. But he didn't. What he was trying to do was make sure that voices were heard. Don't block the voices of those who can change your life. Who are trying to save you. Yeah, his law wasn't that you have to believe them, but you can't stop them from speaking. You have to allow them to say what they're going to say. And because their voices were out there, it changed people's hearts. And they did repent. In verse 26, And because the people did repent of their iniquities and idolatries, the Lord did spare them. And they began to prosper again in the land. And it came to pass that Shul begat sons and daughters in his old age. And there were no more wars in the days of Shul. And he remembered the great things that the Lord had done for his fathers in bringing them across the great deep into the promised land. Wherefore, He did execute judgment in righteousness all his days. Yay, Shul. What a nice ending to a story. So now look at those last few verses and the stories that we've talked about so far. Shul was benevolent to his rebellious brother. Yep. He was nice to Nimrod because Nimrod surrendered his kingdom and was nice to him. Obviously, he raised good sons. Right. He protected the prophets. And he remembered, yeah, just like Arihah did, right? He yep. remembered the great things that the Lord had done for his fathers. Yeah, I have a feeling that Moroni really likes Shul too, which is why we get a bit more of his story than on some of the other ones. But great story. So it's going to be hunky-dory all the way through Ether, right? Uh, We're on a good start. But, uh, we- uh, tell you what, let's just go ahead with chapter 8 and see how it goes. 
Okay. I don't like the <laughs> reticence in your voice. Just you wait and see. Okay, so we've got Omer, who's the son of Shul. So now chapter 8 is going to take us into Omer's story. He has a son named Jared, and Jared rebels against Omer. And then he flatters away half the kingdom, and he puts Omer into bondage, and Omer gets saved by two other sons who are awesome. This is interesting at the end of verse 5. It came to pass that they did give battle unto him by night. Now, that's pretty rare. We don't usually see battles happening by night, but they did. These are the two sons of Omer, Ezra and Coriantumr, two great guys. They go in, they rescue their father, and they were about to slay Jared. Remember, usually you capture the rebel and you don't slay him. They were about to, but he pled with them that they wouldn't slay him and he would give the kingdom to his father. Not like he would have any choice, but anyways, they had compassion on him. And so he got to live. They granted him his life. Well, maybe that'll turn out like Korhor did before, you know. Where he'll be loyal. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe not. Let's take a look at verse 7. And now Jared became exceedingly sorrowful because of the loss of the kingdom. For he had set his heart upon the kingdom and upon the glory of the world. Now the daughter of Jared, being exceedingly expert and seeing the sorrows of her father, thought to devise a plan whereby she could redeem the kingdom unto her father. Now the daughter of Jared was exceedingly fair. And it came to pass that she did talk with her father and said unto him, Whereby hath my father so much sorrow? Hath he not read the record which our fathers brought across the great deep? Oh, listen to that. Here's a daughter who wants to help her dad feel better. And she basically is saying, hey, you should read the scriptures. Won't that help you feel better? This is interesting because it's the first time we've got a reference to records being brought with them. Yeah. Now, that's important Yeah. because if you think about the scriptures that we have today, the oldest book that we know of as far as age and that we're sure of the age, the oldest book really is the book of Ether that we have. But the oldest book is Genesis. That would have been traditionally believed to be written at the time of Moses. This is long before Genesis. Yeah. So I don't know what records they had, but we don't have them today. Yeah, only that we know that Adam was commanded to keep a record. And so it would be maybe then on up to, you know, through Noah and so forth. So not sure. But either way, they've got it. Well, I wonder if these records were in fact known in the book of Abraham in the Pearl of Great Price. In chapter 1, verse 28, Abraham says... But I shall endeavor hereafter to delineate the chronology running back from myself to the beginning of the creation. For the records have come into my hands, which I hold unto this present time. What records are those? Mm. Could those be the same records? Now, they couldn't obviously be the exact same records because the people of Jared would have left a couple of centuries before Abraham. Right. But could it have been a copy? Now, that's interesting. Now, those records that Abraham and the daughter of Jared are referring to, we don't have them, but it's interesting that both Abraham and Moroni describe the records as containing the story of the creation and on up through to the Tower of Babel. Yeah. So that could be the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good guess. And if so, it would contain the story of Cain and Abel. But, of course, she just wants her dad to read the scriptures so that he would, you know, feel good and better about life. And maybe that's (laughs) it. Maybe that's what she's saying. Maybe. I love your optimism. (laughs) So let's look at the rest of verse 9. This is still the daughter of Jared speaking. Behold, is there not an account concerning them of old, that they, by their secret plans, did obtain kingdoms and great glory? Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I think I know which part of the scriptures she's reading. Can you imagine encouraging someone to read the scriptures so they can better do evil? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know that Antichrist Sherem? He was on to something. We've got to look into that. <laughs> right. All right. And verse 10. And now, therefore, let my father send for Achish, the son of Kimnor. And behold, I am fair, and I will dance before him, and I will please him that he will desire me to wife. Wherefore, if he shall desire of thee that ye shall give unto him me to wife, 
Then shall ye say, I will give her, if ye will bring unto me the head of my father, the king. And now Omer was a friend to Achish. Wherefore, when Jared had sent for Achish, the daughter of Jared danced before him, that she pleased him, insomuch that he desired her to wife. And it came to pass that he said unto Jared, Give her unto me to wife. And Jared said unto him, I will give her unto you, if you will bring unto me the head of my father, the king. Okay, let's just review here for a minute. Achish and the king, Omer, are friends. Jared, the son of Omer, is going to Achish, the friend of Omer, and is going to, with his daughter, it's her plan, manipulate him into wanting her to wife. And the bride price is, give me the head of my father. They did dowries different in that day. But can you imagine Achish saying, oh, uh, you mean my friend, Omer? Yes. I mean, that's pretty gutsy. He must have known something about Achish's character. Well, and Jared's daughter had to have been awfully desirable. I guess. She certainly knew what she was doing. So Achish gets the kinsfolk to join with Jared's house. And if we look at these coming verses, we get phrases like in verse 13, swear unto me. Well, that doesn't sound good. Achish is saying to his people that you will be faithful unto me in the thing which I shall desire you. Notice he hasn't yet said what that thing is. And in verse 14, they all swear unto him that whoso should vary from the assistance which Achish desired should lose his head. And whoso should divulge whatever thing it is should lose his life. Again, they still don't know what it is. But they administered unto them of these oaths which were given by them of old. And that brings us to 16. In verse 16, it says, And they were kept up by the power of the devil to administer these oaths unto the people to keep them in darkness, to help such as sought power to gain power and to murder and to plunder and to lie and to commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. So this is what they've just walked into, gotten themselves into, what the daughter of Jared put into their hearts to search out. Verse 18, it came to pass that they formed a secret combination. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Even as they of old, which combination is most abominable and wicked above all in the sight of God. For the Lord worketh not in secret combinations, neither doth he will that man should shed blood, but in all things hath forbidden it from the beginning of man. So we find ourselves walking into this really horrible situation. I don't know that this speaks well to the people who were so ready to join the secret combination. Jay pointed out that he wanted allegiance from these people and that they were willing to kill one another if they ratted out on this secret. Can you imagine that? To me, I'm reminded of coming to my wife and saying, well, I'll tell you something, but you got to promise not to be mad. <laughs> How often does that going to work out, right? You yeah. would think that presented with that scenario, you would think, well, okay, I don't know. We need to find out what is being asked for before I enter into such a serious oath. But it was like they were hungry go. for it, like they were ready for a fight, like they just wanted any yeah. excuse at all to explode and loyalty to this tribe that he was creating. Agreed. Now, in the next few verses, Moroni takes a moment to talk to the Gentiles, the people who will receive this record, us. Okay? So this is directed to us. Verse 20. And now I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it hath been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and they are had among the Lamanites. And they have caused the destruction of this people, of whom I am now speaking, and also the destruction of the people of Nephi. And whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance upon them, and yet he avenged them not. Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God 
that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins, and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain. And the work, yea, even the work of destruction come upon you, yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction if ye shall suffer these things to be. Now keep in mind, before I go on, he has just watched this happen. Yeah. He is, as far as we know, the last surviving Nephite yeah. going on. Wherefore, the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because of the secret combination which shall be among you. Or woe be unto it, because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it, and also upon those who built it up. For it cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. And it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people, for it is built up by the devil, who is the father of all lies, even that same liar who beguiled our first parents, yea, even that same liar who hath caused man to commit murder from the beginning, who hath hardened the hearts of men, that they have murdered the prophets and stoned them and cast them out from the beginning. Wherefore, I, Moroni, am commanded to write these things that evil may be done away and that the time may come that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men, but that they may be persuaded to do good continually, that they may come unto the fountain of all righteousness and be saved. There's some really powerful yearning there on the part of Moroni. Yeah. He really wants us to understand this. And it's interesting to me that he would call out in verse 25 that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands. Freedom seems to be really important in the Book of Mormon yeah. and in the scriptures. It is important that what we do, we are accountable for. Yeah. It's hard to exercise our agency without that freedom. Right. So that brings us to chapter nine, and we return to the story that we took a break from as Moroni shared his thoughts with us. So here we have the secret combination gathering together Akish and his friends and his kinsfolk, and they're going to overthrow the kingdom of Omer. However, in verse three, the Lord warned Omer in a dream that he should depart out of the land. And he did. He took his family and he took his sons and his daughters and they pitched their tent on the eastern seashore in a place called Ablom. Well, I assume that he didn't take Jared and his family. Exactly. The end of verse 3 makes it clear that all of them accept Jared and his family because, if you may recall, Jared's trying to get him killed. So <laughs> he was not invited to this trip. And so when that happens, Jared's anointed king, and he gives his daughter to Achish to wife. Apparently, he didn't actually have to kill him. He just wanted to be king. Yeah, I, that wasn't part of the deal. I didn't get that. No, I didn't either. But apparently, it, he was happy enough with the results that he gave his daughter to wife. Now, she seems to be a like-minded person to Achish. So let's see how things go with them together. If you continue to read in these verses, you will find that what's the good of having a secret combination if you don't get to use it? Here we got everybody all, you know, oathed up and he didn't get to kill Omer. He's got, he wants to kill somebody. So it turns out he'll kill his father-in-law, Jared. So he kills him while he's on the throne. So now Akish is the king. And... Akish becomes paranoid because, of course, you kind of see the world through your eyes. And if you are constantly striving for power, you assume maybe everybody else is, too. He's so paranoid of one of his sons that he keeps him in prison and starves him till he dies. Now, this is a really common tale among dictators. You know, when you finally gain power and you gain rule, you are 
constantly living in fear of someone rising up and taking it from you. Yeah. Not a very nice life. Yeah. And my curiosity is, did Akish have kids before? Or is this one of the kids between him and Jared's daughter? In other words, how is she feeling about this? Now, if this was maybe one of his other sons from before, you know, maybe she doesn't care so much. But if it was her son, is she okay with this? Akish has another son named Nimra, who is appalled by what his father did to Nimra's brother and starving him to death. And so he gathers those that will follow him and they depart and they go all the way over to the East Coast, find Omer and dwell with them. And I suspect this is the first time Omer is getting a report of what is going on back in his kingdom. And that's got to be hard to hear. So Achish's remaining sons are also power hungry like dad. In verse 11, it says, Wherefore the sons of Achish did offer them money, the people, by which means they drew away the more part of the people after them. And there began to be a war between the sons of Achish and Achish, which lasted for the space of many years. Yea, unto the destruction of nearly all the people of the kingdom. Yea, even all, save it were thirty souls, and they who fled with the house of Omer. So we've got Omer there on the east, who pretty much just lets the power-hungry, wicked, secret combination guys just eat themselves. And I don't say that in a way to assume that he's happy about this. Remember that Jared's daughter is his granddaughter. And, you know, Jared, of course, is son. And so, and Akish is friend. And yet they just destroyed themselves. So when Omer returns to his kingdom, he looks, I'm sure, with great sadness on what it's become and the 30 souls that are left. And so Omer is again restored to his throne to rebuild a broken kingdom. So Omer appoints his son, Emer, to reign in his stead. And Emer reigns righteously. So yay! yay. Doing well now. In verse 16, the Lord began again to take the curse from off the land. Okay, so we're doing better. The people yeah. are prospering exceedingly. In the next few verses, they kind of enumerate a lot of their prosperity and having to do with different animals. Verse 19 has a particularly curious phrase. And there were elephants and kurilums and kumums, and they were useful unto man. But that's all we really know about them. Well, we know what elephants are, but we certainly don't know that there were elephants on the American continent. So that's been a, a curiosity, certainly. And you have the similar conversation about horses. They mention horses in this verse as well. There's been a great deal of discussion where that's concerned. And we talked about that earlier in the year. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it now. But if you want to go to Know Why at Book of Mormon Central, they have a Know Why for why are horses mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And they also discuss Kurilums and Kumums. Those are not translated words. We have no idea what those beasts are. So no. use your imagination. Yes, I have a good imagination for that kind of thing. Also in verse 18, something that might be of interest is that it mentions swine, so pigs, in the list of animals which were useful for food. Now, we wouldn't see that with the Nephites and Lamanites because they were under the law of Moses and the Food restrictions, or the law of health, if you will, in the law of Moses, forbade the eating of pigs. But these people weren't under the law of Moses. That hadn't even happened yet. No, they were well over half a millennium before Moses. So. Yep. So pigs and bacon are on the menu. Nice. It's kind of a neat little detail. One of the more powerful details, particularly about Emer, though, shows up in verse 22. Emer, quote, even saw the son of righteousness oh, that and is did cool. rejoice and glory in his day. That's amazing. Yeah. We haven't had any discussion of people seeing the Lord since the brother of Jared, and that's several generations back. Yeah. So Emer led a very good and righteous life and had a good reign. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, okay, so going on, Emer has a son, Coriantum, 
And in verse 23, it says that it came to pass that Coriantum did walk in the steps of his father, Emer, and did build many mighty cities, and did administer that which was good unto his people in all his days. And it came to pass that he had no children, even until he was exceedingly old. Now, I really like this. I like it any time in the scriptures we get a window into humanness. We know these people lived a good long time. And here it was, he and his wife stayed together, even though he was, you know, a king and needed to have an heir. And yet, I love that he stayed with his wife. It came to pass in verse 24 that his wife died, being 102 years old. And it came to pass that Coriantum took a wife, in his old age a young maid, and begat sons and daughters, wherefore he lived until he was 142 years old. That was the reference I was talking about earlier. We get a sense of these people living kind of a long time. That is interesting because the notion there is, you know, when they've lived so long with his first wife, you would assume that, well, the reason that they may not have sons and daughters could be him, could be her. In yeah. this instance, it was clearly her, but he stayed with her until she died at 102. Yeah. That is very remarkable. Which to me, I mean, you hear the stories of saying, well, they have to take on somebody else in order to have a child, you know, for the kingdom and so forth. But personally, I think what I see in that is two people that really love each other and stayed together. I just think that's great. So Coriantum has a son named Combe who reigns and he has a son named Heth. Now, Heth is a problem. He seeks out secret combinations to overthrow his father. Why? Well, probably because he's not the youngest son. Notice in 25, it says he has other sons and daughters. So, again, Heth wants an option for the kingdom that he wouldn't have otherwise. So, he seeks out the secret combination and then kills his father with his own sword in verse 27. Wow. Yeah, let's bear in mind that Heth's great-grandfather is Emer, who saw the Lord. Yeah. It's not like they didn't have a good upbringing. Yeah. And yet, only a few generations pass, and we get this. Yeah. And then when the prophets come and cry repentance, the people drive them out and cast them into pits. But look what it says in 29. They did all these things according to the commandment of the king. Heth. So he is leading the charge against the prophets and not just casting them out, but casting them into pits to starve, essentially torturing them to death. So as you can imagine, there is now a dearth. No rain has come upon the land. And if that isn't bad enough, poisonous serpents. Now, this is a curse that's going to be with them for a long time. These poisonous serpents come among the land and they kill people and animals and the animals are fleeing southward as the people are as well. And the Lord essentially commands the serpents to stop chasing once they get to that border between the land northward and southward. And they hedge up that entryway that I assume like the narrow pass area. In verse 34, it came to pass that the people did follow the course of the beasts and did devour the carcasses of them which fell by the way, until they had devoured them all. Now, when the people saw that they must perish, they began to repent of their iniquities and cry unto the Lord. Really? You had to wait until there was nothing else? You couldn't have started praying, say, during the dearth, or when the poisonous serpents came, or when, you know, the other tragedies were happening, you had to wait until you consumed all of the fallen carcasses and then say, we should probably change our life. <laughs> I guess sometimes that happens to us. So yeah. the Lord does have mercy on them and again sends rain. And that ends the end of chapter nine. Now, Heth died in the famine. Great. He has a son named Shez who begins to build up this broken kingdom but he's leading the people in righteousness. He remembered what the Lord had done in bringing Jared and his brother across the great deep. Yay! Yeah, that to me means he's aware of the records of his people. And that's great. Now, his son Shez, so this is Shez Jr. in verse 3, did rebel against him 
And I'm thinking when I read that, oh, no, we just had the famine that wiped out all these people. You couldn't stay righteous for, you know, more than one generation. But then it says, nevertheless, Shez was smitten by the hand of a robber because of his exceeding riches, which brought peace again to his father. Okay, well, great. That kind of took care of things. Yeah, normally you might think being killed by a robber is it's a terrible thing, but it, well, it was a real benefit to the kingdom. Sometimes two wrongs do make a right, maybe? <laughs> maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> maybe so. So the people spread across the face of the land. Replakish is Shez's son, and he reigns, but he reigns wickedly. He had many wives, heavy taxes, spacious buildings, lavish throne, tax prisons, which means that if you couldn't pay your taxes, you went to prison and you worked. He got all this fine craftsmanship by kind of slave labor by those people he'd thrown into prison. Does that sound like kind of a familiar king? Think back earlier in the year when we were talking about King Noah. Does that sound familiar? It does. That just seems really similar to me. Yeah. So after 42 years of this, the people were like, that's it. And they revolted against him. They killed him and they drove his descendants out of the land. Now, verse 9 tells us, and this is where we get a break in the lineage. You may have noticed this in chapter 1 when we went through the genealogy. There's a lot of sons of, but not at this point. We have descendant. So after many years, a descendant of Riplakish. His name was Morianton. He gathered together an army of outcasts. And after many years of war, did establish himself king over all the land. So now that lineage, and keep in mind, this lineage is Jared's lineage, when we go all the way back to Jared and the brother of Jared, these are all those who were descendants of Oriha and on down from Jared's line. So now we have Jared's descendants back in charge. In verse 10, it says, and after he had established himself king, he did ease the burden of the people by which he did gain favor in the eyes of the people. And they did anoint him to be their king. I just wonder if there's a difference between how he established himself to be king and once he won over the people, they anointed him to be king. That sounds even more official. Like they're saying, you know what? We're okay with you being king. In verse 11, and he did do justice unto the people, but not unto himself because of his many whoredoms, wherefore he was cut off from the presence of the Lord. Hmm. That to me is interesting that you can have a leader that can do good things to the people but he himself may not be a good person. And the problem is not so much what happens with the people, but he himself is cut off from the presence of the Lord. But the people prospered. They did. And if we go on into chapter 10, we get Kim, Morianton's son, who also reigns wickedly, not that he's had a great example of a father. And now, as a result, we've got just a couple of generations, and we have an unnamed brother of Kim, who rises up in rebellion. And Kim lives out the rest of his days in captivity. So now after 42 years in captivity, Levi, the son of Kim, rebels and reclaims the kingdom. And so now Levi reigns, but he reigns righteously. So yay. Nice. Glad to get back to righteous. He has a son named Coram, who reigns in righteousness. And Coram has a son named Kish, who reigns. We don't really know whether he was righteous or not. Yeah, you can see on my chart here, I'm kind of labeling yellow for those kings that are righteous. I'm just going to put him in there as yellow, as a default. We don't really have any record of him doing anything that's not righteous, and the king before and after him was righteous, so we're going to say righteous. Yeah, we're voting righteous. Lib, the son of Kish, reigns righteously, and in the days of Lib, the poisonous serpents are finally destroyed. Wow. Look at how many generations there were from the time that the poisonous serpents came and hedged up the way. This blocks anybody from getting to the land southward. The land that the Nephites referred to as Zarahemla. Right. And they were cut off from those blessings for, I would say, at least eight generations. But we don't know the distance between when Morianton comes back in. So a long time. That curse was lasting a long time. And look at how many righteous kings in a row it took for the Lord to finally lift that, and he did that through the hands of Lib. Yep. 
Whether he commanded the serpents to go away or whether he inspired the people to properly destroy the serpents, we don't really know, but they're gone now. Yeah. And the people are allowed to go into the land southward to hunt, including Lib himself, who is described as being a great hunter. Yeah. They preserve the land southward for hunting, so they don't build cities down there. They keep it as hunting land. Yeah. And the people prosper. And specifically in verse 28, and never could be a people more blessed than were they and more prospered by the hand of the Lord. Yeah. Well, that's great. That is Way great. to go, Lib. Yeah, Lib's nice another job. one of my heroes. I love that he kept that pattern going and blessed his people. And I love, too, that he wasn't greedy about all the resources in the land southward. They used it for what they needed, but they kind of left it as a wilderness preserve. That was pretty right. cool. But then we get Hertham, the son of Lib, who reigns. But after 24 years, he's overthrown and lives in captivity for the rest of his days. The next four generations, Heth, Aaron, Amnagada, and Coriantum live in captivity. So four generations, all in captivity. Now we get Com. Com, specifically Com, the son of Coriantum, finally rebels, draws away half the kingdom, battles King Amgid, and defeats him. And Com grappled with robbers and secret combinations, but did not defeat them. And that takes us to the end of chapter 10, and we're to chapter 11 now. All right, guys, we've covered a lot of history. I hope the visuals have been helpful as we've walked down what was going on. There's some more details here as we get to Ether, who's our final prophet. This is where Moroni is going to spend most of his time. But let's take a look at some things. So in the first eight verses, in the days of Calm, the prophets cry repentance, but the people reject. Let's take a look in verse two. It came to pass that the prophets were rejected by the people and they fled unto Calm for protection, for the people sought to destroy them. And they prophesied unto Calm many things. And he was blessed in all the remainder of his days. Yay! The reason I think that's really cool, for as much of a little snippet as that is, what's the difference in the blessings received because of how you treat the prophets and their message? The people rejected and tried to destroy them. They received nothing. Com protected them, and they prophesied many things to him, and he was blessed because of how he treated the Lord's servants and their message. So I think that's pretty cool. So Calm has a son named Shiblom who reigns. Shiblom's brother rebels and makes war. Shiblom's brother then, a really swell guy, he executes the prophets who prophesied destruction unto the people. Real class act there. Absolutely. Verse 7 tells us about great wars, famines, pestilences during the days of Shiblom, insomuch, and this is an interesting phrase, that there was a great destruction, such an one as never had been known upon the face of the earth. Not since the days of so-and-so, or in our land. Moroni describes it as such an one as never had been known upon the face of the earth. Huge in verse 7. We get no more information about that. But it leads to the people repenting in verse 8. Now, from the Institute Manual, there was a quote that I found from President Joseph F. Smith. This is from his book, Gospel Doctrine. But it talks about the Lord's use of natural disasters to help humble people. We've already talked about the dearth and the poisonous serpents and so on and so forth. This that we talked about in Chiblam's day is all kinds of different things, famines, pestilences, etc. So President Joseph F. Smith says, quote, The Latter-day Saints, though they themselves tremble because of their own wickedness and sins, believe that great judgments are coming upon the world because of iniquity. They firmly believe in the statements of the Holy Scriptures that calamities will befall the nations as signs of the coming of Christ to judgment. They believe that God rules in the fire, the earthquake, the tidal wave, the volcanic eruption, and the storm. Him they recognize as the master and ruler of nature and her laws, and freely acknowledge his hand in all things. We believe that his judgments are poured out to bring mankind to a sense of his power and his purposes, 
that they may repent of their sins and prepare themselves for the second coming of Christ to reign in righteousness upon the earth. We believe that these severe natural calamities are visited upon men by the Lord for the good of his children to quicken their devotion to others and to bring out their better natures, that they may love and serve him, end quote. Nice. Yeah, true, but also a little frightening. Yes. As we go on in verses 9 through 11, Shiblam is killed. Seth, who... It says there, it just mentions Seth in verse 9. So we don't quite know his relationship to Shiblam unless we go back to Ether chapter 1, verse 11, where we get the genealogies and it does state that Seth is Shiblam's son. He ends up living in captivity all his days. Seth's son Aha is able to get the kingdom back, but he reigns wickedly. And then Etham, who's his son, reigns wickedly. So in verse 12... We are told, And it came to pass in the days of Etham, there came many prophets and prophesied again unto the people. Yea, they did prophesy that the Lord would utterly destroy them from off the face of the earth, except they repented of their iniquities. And it came to pass that the people hardened their hearts and would not hearken unto their words. And the prophets mourned and withdrew from among the people. Now that's a bad omen. Yeah. It feels like what we've just been seeing with Mormon and his day, or even before when the Lord took the disciples away, the disciples who would tarry. Yeah, it's one thing certainly to slay the prophets or drive them out or starve them, but if they are told to leave, you're in trouble. Yeah. Big trouble. So let's take a look at that trouble in verse 15 through 19 in those verses. Etham has a son named Morin, and he reigns wickedly as well. And there arose a mighty man among them in iniquity. And that's it. What an interesting description to have. We don't know his name, <laughs> but he's a mighty man in iniquity. And he rebels and divides the kingdom. Uh, good for him. Yeah, I guess. So Morin eventually reclaims the kingdom, but another mighty man, who is a descendant of the brother of Jared. Now, this offers an interesting insight. This guy, this competitor for the throne, is a descendant of the brother of Jared. The fact that he mentions it, and that we know that the lineage we've been following is Jared's lineage, makes me wonder if the competition for the throne, if that's often happening between those that are descendants of the brother of Jared or those who claim descendancy from Jared. I don't know how consistently that's true, but that may be something interesting. It's possible, or it could be a situation here that the brother of Jared's line maybe has maintained its righteousness during all this time. And perhaps this is kind of a righteous crusade on the part of this mighty man, that he is restoring righteousness to the kingdom, perhaps. Yeah, it's possible. But if that's true, and if the lineage of the conqueror continues, then we're going to end up with Coriantumr. Yep. And that's a problem. But whatever the case, <laughs> take a look at this. When Morin gets put into bondage the rest of his days, that is the end of the line of Jared as far as rulers are concerned. Because Morin's son is Coriantor and his son is Ether. Mm -hmm. So Morin loses the throne. Ether would have been his grandson and heir to the throne. But... They're out. They're out of power. So instead, Ether grows up as someone who could, if he followed the pattern, raise up people and try to take the throne back. But look what's happening in his days, in Ether's days, or his father's days. This is what Ether would have grown up with. In verse 20, And in the days of Coriander, there also came many prophets and prophesied of great and marvelous things and cried repentance unto the people. And except they should repent... The Lord God would execute judgment against them to their utter destruction. And that the Lord God would send or bring forth another people to possess the land by his power after the manner by which he brought their fathers. And they did reject all the words of the prophets because of their secret society and wicked abominations. Now, did you catch that in 21? This is a prophecy of others that would come to inherit the land. 
Do we know about these people? We do. It's the Nephites. Well, and the Mulekites. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is that given the time frame here, it's possible that they're already there. We don't know. Yeah, the overlap is really interesting as far as what's happening there. But you may well be right about this. We know once we get to the end that Coriantumr is going to be discovered by the Mulekites. So that's certainly interesting. But we don't know for sure. Right. For our purposes now, this is the world that Ether is growing up in. So when Ether gets to whatever age, he sides with the prophets. He rejects the whole political, I'm going to get my kingdom back for my people and my lineage to restore Jared to the throne. He's saying, look, we got to save our people. And yeah. so I love the fact that we've had prophets that keep visiting and preaching and people don't, we only have just a fraction of the information, but, you know, people aren't listening, but Ether listens. Someone who could have followed a very different path, like generations before, but he's going to follow the prophet. What a blessing. And that's such a great admonition for all of us. There's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from President Henry B. Eyring. This is from April 1997 General Conference. He says, quote, Looking for the path to safety in the Council of Prophets makes sense to those with strong faith. When a prophet speaks, those with little faith may think they hear only a wise man giving good advice. Then, if his counsel seems comfortable and reasonable, squaring with what they want to do, they take it. If it does not, they consider it either faulty advice or they see their circumstances as justifying their being an exception to the counsel. Those without faith may think they hear only men seeking to exert influence for some selfish motive. Every time in my life, when I have chosen to delay following inspired counsel or decided that I was an exception, I came to know that I had put myself in harm's way. Every time that I have listened to the counsel of prophets, felt it confirmed in prayer, and then followed it, I have found that I moved towards safety. End quote. Such an important thing to remember now. And what a great lesson that we're seeing examples of over and over again in the hundreds of years that we've covered today in our lesson. Whew, so many years. Let's learn from that. Let's take the pleadings of Moroni and do better at anchoring ourselves in the Savior through his servants. Remember, this was written for us, so let's be sure to study it and apply it as best we can. Keep reading your scriptures and we'll look forward to talking to you more about the Jaredites next time. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>